Hello everyone, continuing with the discussion of the subject wise test for dermatology, we will begin with question number 16. <clears throat> Have a look at this question. This deals with mycosis fungoides. Is it the most common skin lymphoma? Potrius microapsis is a common, indolent course and a good prognosis or it presents with diffuse erythroderma. Which of these is not true? So to begin answering this question, let's discuss mycosis fungoides in a little detail. Yes, of course, just as much detail as is required for you. What is this? This is also called as C T C L. C T C L. What is the full form of this? This is a cutaneous T cell lymphoma. This is also the most common primary lymphoma in skin. So it is the most common primary lymphoma in skin. Generally seen in the elderly, this has a chronic indolent course but with a poor prognosis why because it is going to ultimately lead in the death of the patient so this even though depending upon the stage of the disease may have a chronic indolent course but it is fatal this disease eventually is going to be fatal and will result in death of the patient. Now, what are the stages of the disease? The first stage to arise is the patch followed by plaque, then tumor, ultimately leading to erythroderma. So this is how the disease progresses and depending upon what stage you pick up the patient, the course may vary, eventually fatal. So apart from skin, it may also have a visceral involvement that the tumor cells may spread into the uh, systemic organs. What are the primary cells of this disease? The primary cells are the cancerous lymphocytes. The tumor lymphocytes are also called as surgery cells. These are the malignant T cells which are roaming around in the skin, ultimately spreading into the viscera. So these surgery cells are T cells which have an abnormal convoluted cerebri form nucleus. Clear? I will just show you a photo. It will be much clearer to you. See, these are the three stages. The patch, plaque followed by tumor and then erythroderma. You are not asked the images in mycosis fungoides. So you need not to remember how it looks in the skin. What you are asked are these surgery cells. These are cells with abnormal pleomorphic cerebriform nucleus. And you may be asked this in the image based question. Potrier's abscesses. When we do a skin biopsy from the tumor, we see colonies or collection of these malignant T cells in the epidermis. If you remember from the anatomy of skin, T cells are not to be present in the epidermis but in this cutaneous lymphoma they are there in the epidermis. This is also called as lymphocyte epi 
epidermotropism. Epidermotropism means they are moving towards the epidermis and this collection is a very, very important question, extremely important. There are only a few abscesses in dermatology which are asked and Poitrier's abscess is one of them. These are collection of T cells in the epidermis. So these are mostly the questions that are asked in this my mycosis fungoides. Apart from that, uh, what they ask you is also the surgery syndrome. So what is Sagery syndrome? In this you have the findings of erythroderma, then generalized lymphadenopathy and a concentration of more than 10 part 3 Sagery cells per millimeter cube of the blood. So these are the three criteria for Sagery syndrome. This is generally the end stage and it rapidly ends in death of the patient. Here the entire skin of the patient, the lymph nodes, the viscera are infiltrated with these malignant cells and this is called as Sagery syndrome. Now what is the treatment for this disease? The treatment depends upon the stage. In the patch stage, we may give a topical chemotherapy to the patient with nitrogen mustards, with the PUVA, which is phototherapy. In the plaque stage, generally the treatment of choice is EBRT, which is total skin electron beam therapy. This is also the treatment of choice for mycosis fungoides. However, in the later stages which includes the tumor and the erythroderma stage, we do not have much option apart from systemic chemotherapy drugs. Okay? So the management of this disease depends upon the stage, but if you are not given the stage in the question and you were just asked what is the treatment for mycosis fungoides, in that case the answer is electron beam therapy. Clear to everyone? Yes? So now we move back to the question. So which of these is not true? It definitely is the most common lymphoma. Portrius microapsis are definitely seen. Yes, it has an indolent course, but a poor prognosis. It presents with diffuse erythroderma. It can when the patient is in Sagery syndrome. So the answer to this question is option C. I hope I am clear to all of you. Moving on to question number 17. Pomphilix affects which site in the body? So you got to have a fair idea of what pomphilix is. It has recently become a common question. It wasn't asked till some time, some time back, but now they are quite fond of this entity which is called as pomphilix. What is it? It's actually a type of So moving on to moving on to question number 17, pomphilix affects which site of the body? 
Pomflex recently has become a favorite topic of these examiners. So you need to be aware of what this is. This is a type of endogenous eczema. Amongst its causes, mostly it is idiopathic, but it may also be due to allergy to nuts, alcohol, certain drugs. The causes may or may not be known to the patient when they come to you. So causes may be variable depending on whatever is the cause of any type of eczema. Now how does it manifest? It manifests like this. See, what do you see in the image here? You see multiple deep seated vesicles, fluid filled deep seated vesicles in the skin which may not be clearly visible to you but when you palpate it's easily palpable. So these are multiple deep seated fluid filled vesicles which on palpation give the feeling of sago grain. Sago is sabudana, the white uh, small balls of sabudana, they look like this. So this gives the appearance of a sago grain. Where is this seen? This is generally seen in the palmar surface of finger, palms and soles. So this is where you generally see pomphilix. I hope I am clear to everyone. What you have to remember is the site, the sago grain appearance and that it is a type of eczema. Clear to all? Great. Now moving back to the question, where does it affect? It affects option A, palms and soles. Moving on to question number 18. Sebaceous cysts are seen in which of these? Now that is a difficult question if you do not remember these syndromes separately. Well as a matter of fact in surgery these are quite important questions so you need to know the components of all these syndromes okay <coughs> fun fact all of these are associated with colonic polyps so all these syndromes are associated with colon polyps but they do have Uh, identity of their own. First part of the question is sebaceous cyst. I will tell you what syndromes in common knowledge are associated with sebaceous cyst which may be asked to you. Number one, Gardner syndrome. Number two, basal cell nevus syndrome is also called as Gordon syndrome and number three is Pacchio Nikia congenita. So for the purpose of your questions these are the three most important syndromes in dermatology which are associated with sebaceous cyst out of which mostly the questions for you are limited to first one which is Gardner's syndrome. So please keep Gardner's syndrome in mind when they talk about sebaceous cyst. Now what exactly is Gardner's syndrome? This is also called as familial colorectal polyposis. This is a 
subtype of familial adenomatous polyposis with an autosomal dominant type of inheritance. What do you see here? You see features in the colon and then you see features outside the colon. In the colon you see polyps while outside you see osteomas. soft tissue tumors and sometimes in some patients thyroid tumors but that is not important mostly for you what is important is number one polyps then bony osteomas and soft tissue tumors. Now what is there in these soft tissue tumors? In the soft tissue tumors you see desmoid tumors, fibromas and sebaceous cyst. Okay? So this is what you see in Gardner syndrome. Remember these findings, rest the detail will be covered in surgery. I am just covering it in short. What were the other options in this question? The other options were Turcotte syndrome. What do you see in Turcotte syndrome? Again you see colon polyps. Then medulloblastomas, congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium and glioblastoma multi forming. Okay? So these are the findings of Turcotte syndrome. What are the other options in our question? Cowden. What are the things that you see in Cowden syndrome? Again you see colon polyps. Fibrocystic disease, breast and thyroid tumors. So in Cowden generally the question comes on fibrocystic disease. And what was the last option in this question? Muir-Torr syndrome. <laughs> This is a disease where there is a DNA micro satellite instability. This is an important question. You generally see neoplasms in this question. But where are those neoplasms? One in the skin and apart from skin in the viscera. What do you see in the skin? You generally see sebaceous cancers, which may be a sebaceous adenoma, sebaceous carcinoma, sebaceous uh, epithelioma, whichever type of malignancy affecting the sebaceous gland. And next thing that you find in the skin here is a keratoacanthoma. Amongst the malignancies, it could be GI or genito urinary malignancies. Is me aapko question kis pe aata hai? Question aata hai micro satellite instability. The gene is the MMR gene. Then you get questions on sebaceous cancers and visceral malignancies. Clear? This is about Muir-Torr syndrome and that it also has an autosomal dominant inheritance. So apart from the question we have also covered the other options which I hope will help you with the uh, exam. What is the answer here? Sebaceous cysts are seen in option B. The answer to this is Gardner's syndrome. Clear? 
had it been sebaceous cancer, it would have been Murtor syndrome, but sebaceous cyst, Gardner syndrome. Moving on to question number 19, Gautrin's papules or Gautrin's sign are seen in which of these options. Now I am telling you this along with other findings of this disease are like a question which will come every alternate exam. Dermatomyositis is the most important connective tissue disease when it comes to MCQs. The SLE will be covered in medicine but there are not much cutaneous uh, findings there with scleroderma. Yes, there are some findings, but they don't ask it as much as they ask dermatomyositis. So you have to be essentially aware of every possible question related to dermatomyositis. What are the <coughs> findings here? You have skin involvement plus muscle involvement. Now what are the findings in skin? Number one that I see here is rash which is called as heliotrope sign. This is periorbital erythema and edema, heliotrope sign. Number two, what you see for the questions is Gautrin papule. These are skin colored papulosquamous lesions present on the interphalangeal joints and knuckles of both hands and feet. Okay. So, heliotrope sign, Gautrin, papule. Next thing is Gautrin sign. This is linear erythema on the fingers and the dorsum of hand and feet like it runs linearly along the fingers. Fourth thing that they ask you here is the shawl sign and Holster sign. These is these are again signs depending upon where you see the erythema. If you see the erythema on the upper back and arms, the distribution where you wear a shawl, then it is called as shawl sign. Or if you see it on lateral thigh and the flanks, then it is called as the Holster sign. See, holster is that case in which the policemen keep their pistols. So it goes laterally like this, and where that rests, there you see the erythema. So it is called as holster sign. Other thing we see here are peri ungual telangiectasias. These are telangiectasias in the proximal nail fold and lateral nail fold on the nails. And the last thing that you need to remember with this is before I erase this, please remember that's a question, this, this and this. Dermatomyositis, every sign is a question. And the last thing that you have to remember is Poikiloderma. This is a triad of skin
pigment defect plus atrophy plus telangiectasias. So, they just ask you where poikiloderma is seen and what is poikiloderma. So, you need to know it involves one hypohyperpigmentation plus skin atrophy plus dilated blood vessels called as telangiectasia. So, that is a triad seen in poikiloderma, which is generally seen in most of the cutaneous uh, component of the connective tissue diseases, but in dermatomyositis, it is slightly more prominent. Clear? Great. And what do you see apart from skin? We see myositis. What is the myositis here? There is a symmetrical proximal myopathy because of which patient may have dysphonia. Dyspnea, inability to climb stairs, or even comb the hair. So, all the findings that you see in a proximal muscle disorder will be seen here. Amongst the enzymes positive, you will have raised muscle enzymes like aldolase, lactolate, dehydrogenase, creatine kinase. In the serology, you will have ANA positive, PL7, PL. 12 anti jo antibody positive treatment systemic steroids hydroxychloroquine azathioprine as is the case with most of the connective tissue disorders so this is what you need to know about dermatomyositis and that makes the answer a the correct option for question number 19 which is about gotrin's papule i have an image here to show you they are generally not asked an image, Gottron's papule. What you get in image is the heliotrope sign, most commonly because that is the most prominent finding being around the eye. And the next thing that you get in the image is this Gottron papule. You see these tiny skin colored to slightly erythematous papules present on the interphalangeal joints of the fingers as we read in the text. In the treatment, I have mentioned, but I am just writing it again so that you know, steroids and HCQS, hydroxychloroquine are the most important treatment options for DM. Now, moving on to the next question, which is question number 20. This is an image based question. What is this image showing you? This is an image of a patient where we have certain finding on the neck. Now, I don't know what this is. I don't know what the image is. So what do I do? I go to the options to see what they are actually trying to ask me. In the options I see there are some micronutrients mentioned. So this is probably a deficiency disorder. Now, I run my mind in which deficiencies do I see a finding like this on the neck. And after thinking a lot, yes, for a few seconds. So, after thinking, I come to this diagnosis. What is my diagnosis? My diagnosis for this image is pellagra. What is a pellagra? Pellagra is due to deficiency of vitamin B5 which is no no I think it is B3 we will confirm that I think it is B3 so this is niacin now what do you find in niacin you have a triad of D's. What are the D's? Number first D
to happen is diarrhea number 2 is dermatitis and if the disease remains uncorrected the last thing to happen is dementia and even then if you don't correct the disease the fourth d i add to this is death this would ultimately lead to death of the patient if it is uncorrected and this is also the order in which it happens the first thing to happen in pellagra is diarrhea so pellagra begins with the gi tract first thing is diarrhea then the patient will have dermatitis after that dementia and if it still remains uncorrected death so this is also the order in which the disease progresses moving to dermatitis here the patient has a photo sensitive rash which when asked from you the most common locations that are asked from you is one neck two hands when in the neck it is called as kesel necklace and when in the hands it is called as the gauntlet sign so these are the two terms that you need to remember with the rash of pellagra <coughs> with kesel necklace one thing to remember is the dermatomes which it affects mostly c3 and c4 dermatome now what is the treatment for this disease the treatment for this is supplementation with niacin or nicotinic acid this is the supplementation for pellagra and if a patient is on att with isoniazide then supplement with pyridoxin if a patient is just a corn eater ask them to include other sources in their meal so these are otherwise the two most important causes of pellagra corn predominantly corn eaters and two patients on isoniazid three alcoholism okay so if these findings are there correct these findings along with which you also supplement niacin i have certain images to show to you see in this image and this image the rash is on the neck distribution of cervical 3 and 4 dermatomes kesel necklace and this image in the end here this shows that the rash is on the hands the dorsa which are the sun exposed photo exposed sites so this is called as the gauntlet sign while this is your kesel necklace all right these are very very important for images also moving on to next question which is question number 21 scabies we all know how important as a topic scabies is burrows in scabies are mainly seen in which layer of the epidermis or the dermis so what are burrows what is scabies scabies is a type of infestation what is scabies scabies is a type of infestation with a mite called as sarcoptes scabiae var hominis you also need to know that this mite has four legs yes you need to know this that it has four legs then what is the incubation period incubation period for the first episode is around 4 to 5 weeks while for the second episode or subsequent is around 2 to 3 days 
Why? Because this is generally a type 4 hypersensitivity response to the saliva or feces of the mite. Now on this page, they will ask you this, this, most importantly this. All these are important when it comes to scabies. Clinical presentation, you see multiple papules, nodules, excoriations along a distribution which is called as circle of Hebra, finger webs, like draw a patient here. Where does it start? Starts like this. Sorry for my writing. This starts here, goes here, axillae, trunk, and the perineal region. So, this is how it is distributed. This is called as the circle of Hebra. In the adults, the lesions are below the neck, spare, palms and soles. However, in infants, you see all body involvement, palms and soles are involved and you see multiple vesicular pustular lesions also in the baby. So this is essentially the difference between adult and infantile scabies. And when they talk about nodular scabies, you need to know that nodular lesions are generally seen in genital scabies. And when they talk about Norwegian scabies, which is also called as crusted scabies. This is generally seen in people who are HIV positive or alcoholic. You see millions of mites on the body and that despite this there is no itching. Clear? Now, how do you diagnose? Most pathognomic finding is a burrow. This is the most pathognomic finding in scabies. Papules may happen anywhere, nodules may happen in any disease, but burrows are only and only seen in scabies. So this is how a burrow looks like. A small linear track on the skin. This is where the mite actually lives. And where in skin is this seen? This is seen in stratum corneum. This is seen in stratum corneum. This is where the mite lives, lays its eggs and ultimately new small mites crawl out of it onto your skin. I have also put the image of the scabies mite. Why? Because they also ask you how does a scabies mite look like. They may just give you an image, ask you to identify the organism. So have a look at it. It's a short, broad, flattened mite which has these four pairs of legs, right? This is what will help you identify from this. The only other uh, such an organism which will come in your question is a pediculus, which is the lice. Lice looks very different. So you just need to differentiate between the lice and this scabies mite. Scabies, aisa dikhega, and lice will be a more long, flattened structure with three pair of 
legs. So this is how a louse will look like but this is how a scabies mind looks like. So this is where you have to differentiate between these two creatures and this is a very very important question here. Now what is the treatment of choice for scabies? The treatment of choice is Pometrin 5% cream amongst the oral agents you have Ivermectin 12 mg tablet for permethrin it is a single application but for Ivermectin there are two doses 0 and 10 so you give it on one day and then you give it on the 10th day and you also have to treat the family because this is a disease which spreads by touch so most of the family members also have findings even if they admit or not so you also have to treat the family wash their clothes trust me they ask you how to treat a type, uh, patient of scabies in the option it will be given whether you will wash their clothes whether you will treat the family for how long will you apply permethrin 8 to 12 hours so these are also the findings that you need to remember moving on to the question the burrows and scabies are seen in which layer? Option A, stratum con. Question number 22. Earliest sign in tuberous sclerosis is? As a genodermatosis, the most important genodermatosis for you are tuberous sclerosis and neurofibromatosis. And of late, I've seen that the questions on tuberous sclerosis exceed NF. So, kindly make yourself well aware of the findings of tuberous sclerosis. Here, the question is the earliest sign. Now, let us discuss a bit about tuberous sclerosis. This is also called as Bonneville disease, important. It is also called as epiloa. Why is this called as epiloa? Because this is a triad of epilepsy, which is EPI. Then LO, LO is low intelligence. And the third A is for adenoma. So this is a triad of these three findings. It is an autosomal dominant disorder where the defect is on chromosome 9 and 16. Okay. What is the earliest finding? The earliest sign to appear on skin is ash leaf macule which are also called as melanotic spots. So ash leaf macules are also called as melanotic spots and these are generally present in the babies. So if a baby is going to come to me with epilepsy, the first thing that I will try to find in the baby is I will examine the back, look for slightly hypopigmented lesions. These are hypopigmented lesions which may be present on the back and another thing that I can use in the diagnosis is Wood's lamp. So the question can also come as a baby visits dermatology OPD with recurrent seizures. Which instrument will you use to find a probable diagnosis? So in order to find a probable diagnosis, I may use a Wood's lamp which will make these ash leaf macules more prominent right so what all are the questions on this page on this page you are asked the synonym of Bonneville disease then you are asked this triad inheritance chromosomes earliest sign words <coughs> everything they ask you 
what are the other findings? The other findings are adenoma sebaceum number 2 Keenan's tumor and number 3 shagreen patch these are based on what they ask you yes there are millions other findings on the skin but for the purpose of your mcq these are the three other important findings now what is adenoma sebaceum this is actually a misnomer it has no connection with sebaceous glands these are facial angio fibroma so these are basically soft tissue tumors seen on the face what are kinin tumors these are peri angual fibroma again soft tissue tumor seen around the nail fold chagrin patch are collagenomas seen on the back. So, if you notice the similarity, all these are soft tissue tumors. And along with this, you see multiple angiomyoma, angiomyolipomas in the kidney or the lung plus cortical tubers which are tumors seen in the cortex of the brain and ependymomas, astrocytomas, various other tumors seen in the brain. So this is a disorder where you see a lot of soft tissue tumors. Tuberous sclerosis, I have also included some images, why? Because in this, all these findings are also asked as images. See, look at this here. This is adenoma sebaceum, these are multiple tiny erythematous papules seen in the centrofacial area, center of the face. Then what is this? In this image here that you see, This is a ash leaf macule. This, if you notice, is a shy green patch. And in this image, this is also a ash leaf macule. <coughs> so for the purpose of MCQs, this can be asked, this can be asked, and this is asked. All right? Then one more question that you get with tuberous sclerosis is the treatment. Since this is a genetic disorder, there is no much treatment possible, but a new drug called as rapamycin is used for topical treatment of skin as well as oral treatment of the lung and kidney diseases. Rapamycin is actually an M TOR inhibitor. You may remember it by another name which is called as serolimus. So serolimus is important, rapamycin, its mechanism of action and its uses. Clear to everyone? Great. So moving on to the question here earliest sign seen in tuberous sclerosis is a shy green patch. Answer A. Oops, sorry. Earliest sign seen in tuberous sclerosis is melanotic spot which is another name for ash leaf macules. Sorry for the mistake. Please notice the change. This is another image. What is this? Keenan's tumor. In the AIMS exams, uh, 
last year this was an image uh, given just like this and you were asked the diagnosis no text nothing just identify the disease given in the picture so it was a toenail which had these multiple skin colored projections coming from the nail fold and you were supposed to identify it these are periangular fibromas also called as Keenan's tumors seen in tuberous sclerosis moving on to next question angioedema is characterized by swelling of what so which layer of skin does angioedema affect angioedema is due to swelling seen in the subcutaneous layer this is due to excessive vasodilation which happens due to an intermediate called as brady kinin so what you see is non pitting edema at the side and angioedema is mostly non itchy a symptomatic now what are the questions in this layer subcutaneous excessive vasodilation and the intermediate the swelling here being non pitting so these are the questions that you are asked in angioedema i have an image here if this was an image based question then looking at this image <coughs> or looking at this image see here around the lips these are all images of angioedema now you are also caused asked the causes of angioedema the number first cause is allergic in that it is generally associated with urticaria causes can be insect bite drug food allergen whatever second is when it is associated with connective tissue disorders and malignancies third is drugs in the drugs the most important drugs to cause this are your ace inhibitors mostly being captopril and here also the mediator is brady kinin very very important question fourth cause is hereditary angioedema which is also called as quinkies disease that's a separate topic which is to be discussed in detail so i'll not be doing that here depending upon a question we will discuss hereditary angioedema but the causes amongst which the drug induced angioedema is the most important clear to everyone great moving uh, sorry so for the answer for this question number 23 is the subcutaneous tissue this involves swelling of option a the subcutaneous tissue question number 24 which of the following is known to cause pedal botryo mycosis so which of the following is known to cause this disease now have you heard of it yes slightly difficult because we don't study it on a routine basis but if you ever read it anywhere you will remember because this is a very strange kind of a word now what is botryo mycosis this is actually a infection 
cost by staff or yes, it is a chronic suppurative granulomatous infection of the skin generally caused by staph or is seen in people who are either HIV positive or farmers who have repeated trauma or immunosuppressed individuals. Apart from staph or is certain other bacteria like pseudomonas, E. coli or Klebsiella may also cause it, but the most important organism remains this. Now, how does it look like? It may look like this. What else have you seen what looks like this? Another thing that you must have seen similar looking is mycetoma. Mycetoma which may be bacterial or fungal in the bacterial it is caused by actinomyces, nocardiosis, actinomadura in the bacterial caused by any subcutaneous mycosis. So, botryomycosis is a mycetoma like infection, but not exactly a mycetoma because there are no draining granules. The mycetoma infections, the hallmark is discharge of granules from the draining sinuses. That is not seen here. So, this is a mycetoma like infection caused by Staphylococcus aureus. Treatment is long term anti staphylococcal antibiotics depending upon the culture sensitivity. Pedal botryomycosis. Do not worry, this is not an image based question. Here, the only thing that they ask you is the causative organism. So, causative organism for pedal botryomycosis is option C, staph aureus. These two findings, these two are causes of mycetoma bacterial mycetoma. Moving on to question number 25 which is on Blaschko's lines. Now, I hope this is a simpler question. What is this? Is it diagnostic of lichen simplex chronicus? No. Necrotizing fasciitis? No. Lymphatic distribution? No. The answer is option D. Unlike the previous question, here I have directly come to the answer because this is a relatively easy one. Now, I have an image here to show what Blaschko's lines look like. <coughs> this is how they look like. A cute little baby telling us the distribution of Blaschko's lines. What do you need to remember here? You need to remember that these are lines of development of skin. This is the line along which your keratinocytes migrate and proliferate during embryo genesis and they have no association with your nerves blood vessels or lymphatics. Clear? So, these are lines of development of skin. You see mostly mosaic disorders happening along these like your epidermal nevi, then incontinentia, pigmenti. All the disorders which are primarily affecting the keratinocytes during the phase of embryogenesis, they will appear along the blaschkoid lines. If there are any uh, problems with the blood vessels during embryogenesis, they will along, they will appear along the distribution of the blood vessels. With the nerves, any tumors, any defects, sensory motor along the dermatomes. But with the skin, any problems along the blaschkoid lines. So, this is the basic difference that you have to identify. How are they distributed? Separately, no association with any dermatomes or blood vessel supply. They are present linearly along the extremities and 
circumferentially on the trunk and the scalp. So, any disease which is affecting this disorder will appear along these lines. If you notice in the image here, this is a case of incontinentia pigmenti where this hyperpigmentation is appearing along the blachoid lines. There is a sharp midline demarcation, lines do not cross to the other side and the hyperpigmentation is present along <coughs> the blachoid lines. Clear to all? So, this is also an image based question in incontinentia pigmenti. So, please keep it in mind from here. X-link dominant disorder with a defect in the Nemo chain. So, the answer we have already discussed is option D here. Moving on to question number 26. Which amongst the following is the only recommended diagnostic test for chlamydia? Again, not much to discuss here. It is an easy question. The only test which is recommended these days for the diagnosis of chlamydia is a nucleic acid amplification test, which is also called as NAT. These, what does chlamydia cause? Chlamydia can cause lymphogranuloma venereum, it can cause chlamydial cervicitis, urethritis, a lot of STDs which are caused by chlamydia. It is also the most common cause of uh, bacterial STIs and how do I diagnose it? I diagnose it with a test which is dependent upon the DNA, nucleic acid amplification test. What are the samples? Samples are the first toroid urine in men and a vaginal or endocervical swab in the women. These are the samples that need to be taken for this test and cell culture is no longer recommended. Why? Because chlamydia, even though being a bacteria does not grow in the normal cell cultures, you need to grow it in cell lines, the hala, the egg yolk or the other cellular lines, which is not possible for a routine diagnosis or screening. It's too time consuming, too expensive. The best way is nucleic acid amplification test. I run the test on the kit. Within a few minutes, I have my that is how simple and cost effective the disease is. So, the answer to question number 26 is option B which is NAT. Moving on to question number 27. The following lesion appears on the cheek of a patient of ulcerative colitis subsides with potassium iodide treatment. What is the diagnosis? slightly difficult question because we do not read it in as much detail on a routine basis. But cutaneous associations of these inflammatory bowel diseases are important for the purpose of MCQs. Now coming back to the image, <coughs> <coughs> sorry for the cuff. Well, the magnification is not working. What do we see in the image here? What do I see in the image? In the image, I see certain lesions on the cheeks and on the hands. What am I finding? I am seeing certain erythematous plaques which have a slightly pale appearance in the center surrounded by a lot of erythema and the one here is also shown ulceration. So, these are my findings. No symptoms are mentioned. Only thing that I get from the question is one, the patient has ulcerative colitis. Two, a treatment was effective which is potassium iodide. What do I do now? How do I go about it? First of all, I will run my mind. I will see what are the cutaneous associations of IBDs. What are the cutaneous associations of IBDs? Most importantly, erythema nodosum, then Sweets syndrome,
pyoderma gangrenosum and a lot of other findings along the stoma then etc etc for the purpose of mcq these three are my most important findings which will be one of the answer when i am asked cutaneous association of inflammatory bowel disease now how do these individually look like i have an image here i have to know which of these three looks like this in the image now i just have these three diseases in images in front of me to give you a fair idea of how they look like sweets syndrome looks like these you have multiple painful erythematous plaques present all over the body patient has a lot of fever and esr is very high absolute neutrophil count is very high the point to notice is painful patient has fever how do i treat it i treat it with one systemic steroids two potassium iodide these are the two treatments for sweet syndrome and of course treat the underlying cause moving on to erythema nodosum how does erythema nodosum look like this looks like this multiple painful erythematous nodules point to notice is erythematous nodules present on the extensors of the legs and thigh and they may subside with hyperpigmentation again the esr is high neutrophil count is not that high treatment again steroids potassium iodide and treat the cause clear the <clears throat> third option pyoderma gangrenosum this will be a rapidly enlarging very painful ulcer with a vibrious margin and undermined edges and when it heals it heals with atrophic cribri form scarring so that's how pyoderma gangrenosum looks like this will look like an ulcer treatment again steroids well steroids because all of these are sort of autoimmune disorders with a lot of neutrophils involved so this is how pyoderma gangrenosum looks like if you notice the image the image has an ulcer notice here see this is the ulcer then the violaceous margins are there and undermined edges you may notice when you examine so all the things that i have mentioned in the text you see in the image here so even if you get a question on uh, pyoderma gangrenosum you can sort solve it with the information that i have given you here with erythema nodosum you see these multiple nodules on the shin again the image in the question doesn't look like this but the image in the question looks like this which this so this picture and this picture are similar so what is the diagnosis here the diagnosis as per the question is sweets syndrome 
clear to everyone multiple painful erythematous plaques which appear slightly pale because of the <coughs> intense erythema, edema. It looks slightly pale in the center. So this is Sweet's syndrome. Erythema nodosum, I have just shown you how it looks. Pyroderma gangrenosum, I have shown how it looks. The third option also I have put in the image here to just give you a fair idea of how this erythema marginatum looks like. These are these multiple annular migratory erythema on the trunk. Seen where? This is seen in rheumatic fever. So this is not seen here. This is seen in rheumatic fever. It was just put in to confuse you. Erythema marginatum. Now moving on to question number 28. Perioral pallor and Denny's lines are seen in. Where are they seen? This is quite an easy one. Denny's lines, I'll, I'll expand it for you. Denny's lines are also called as Denny Morgan folds. Now the answer will strike you immediately. Where are these seen? These are seen in atopic dermatitis. Yes, perioral pallor and Denny Morgan folds. These are the minor diagnostic criteria of atopic dermatitis. When I talk about lips or the perioral region, the two findings that are important are lip liquidatus and perioral pallor. Lip liquidatus is you see erythema and chapping of the lips due to recurrent licking with saliva and then you see a perioral pallor together. This is also called as headlight sign. So together this is <coughs> also called as headlight sign which is also a MCQ. Moving on to the findings around the eye. In the eye, you have these extra lines in the infraorbital region. In the infraorbital region, these lines which would normally not cross the pupillary border are crossing the entire length. Many Morgan folds or Denny's lines. Then you also see keratoconjunctivitis which in atopic is the subtype of papillary. In conjunctivitis, you have two types, papillary and bulbar. Here you get the papillary conjunctivitis. Other findings in the eye is anterior keratoconus and anterior subcapsular cataract. Okay? So these are just some other findings in the eye and the lips of atopic dermatitis patients. Moving on to the question. The answer for this is option A, which is AD or atopic dermatitis. Question number 29. Identify the skin disorder seen in this 60 year old patient. Now, this is a question which is predominantly an image based question. I have an image in front of me. And I also have the only hint in the question that this is an elderly patient. It is a 60 year old patient. So this is the only thing that I am getting as a hint here in the question dealing with an elderly subgroup. Now when I look at the image, what am I seeing in the image? One thing is for sure that this is a vesicobullous disorder. I see multiple vesicles. So yes, I am happy. Subgroup I have identified. Now what are the types of bulla? I see multiple tense big bulla. This is the only thing that I appreciate in the image given to me, that they are tense. 
big bully. Where do I see these tense big bully in a 60 year old patient? Absolutely no doubt. The answer is bullis pemphigoid. There is no doubt to this question. What is bullis pemphigoid? This is an autoimmune subepidermal vesiculobullous disorder. What is the target antigen here? The target antigens are BP antigen 1, BP antigen 2. Generally seen in the elderly, patients will mostly be more than 50 years of age. And then you see multiple tense, big, fluid filled bullet predominantly on the lower half of the body. All these are important here. What else? These bullae will be preceded by urticaria and even when you see the bullae they will be present on an erythematous urticarial skin associated with intense itching. Clear? Mucosa is involved only in one third of the patients. Clear? So this is about cutaneous findings. When I do bed test, Nikolsky sign and Bulla spread sign are negative. Sang smear negative. There are no cantholytic cells, but I may see a few eosinophils. When I do histopath, in the histopath, I see a subepidermal bulla with eosinophilic infiltrate. In the DIF, it's a linear deposition of IgG and C3 at the dermoepidermal junction. Treatment mostly a self-limiting disorder but if I have to give some treatment it is mostly steroids at a dose of around 0.5 mg per kg per day. So these are all <coughs> sorry for this these are all the questions that you see in association with bullus pemphigoid. Every word written on this slide is a MCQ. Image you already have in the question. So that's how you identify. Can't make out much of, can't make out much of an erythematous skin in this image, but still for the purpose of text, you need to remember it. So the answer is D. Now I have also put images of the two other things here, pemphigus vulgaris and fallacious, just for the sake of telling you that if this was the image in the question, that's how it would have looked because here we have made the diagnosis based on the image. So image, if it was pemphigus vulgaris, you would see multiple flaccid bullet and red raw erosions, which are not itchy, but they are 
painful and I will also see oral ulcers. So, these are the findings which I will see if the image was that of pemphigus vulgaris and if that was a pemphigus fallacious, I would see these multiple crusted brown erosions and very few flaccid bullae, no mucosa involved. Clear? This is how it would have been in the image if it was pemphigus fallacious. SSS this is the last option. I have not put the image of that, but SSS is mostly seen in babies. This is a disease of infants which is caused by a staph toxin which leads to generalized peeling of the skin. So, that is what it would have been had it been SSS. It would definitely not be the diagnosis if the patient is 60 years old. Clear? Yes. So, we move on to the next question. Number 30, for dyces disease mainly involves A, B, C, D. What does for dyces disease mainly involve? And what is this? While telling you this question, I notice a mistake in this question and I will want you to also notice this mistake. It has somehow slipped my editing, but please notice this mistake in the question here which is also a very important point I would have otherwise told you. Look at this question for dyces disease. That's a different thing and what the question is actually asking you is different. So, please notice the difference. There is something which is called as Fox for dicey disease and there is another entity which is called as for dicey spots. So, there is a difference in both these entities. Here it is mentioning it as a disease. So, you may get confused. Fox for dicey disease is actually involvement of apocrine glands where they are blocked. So, this is also called as apocrine malaria seen mainly in the axillae, groin and the nipple areola disease region while for dicey spots are actually involvement of ectopic sebaceous glands. These are seen in the lips, the buccal mucosa, the penile shaft. Yes, so this is a very important point that you have to notice in the question and thankfully we have made a mistake here. So, further reinforces the difference. When the disease is mentioned, then it is apocrine malaria. However, if a spot is mentioned, then it is ectopic sebaceous gland. So, ideally in this question, how should it have been? It should have been this. This should have been for dicey spots. So, for dicey spots mainly involve which of these? Now, moving on to the image here, this is how your for dicey spots look like. As I already mentioned, these are ectopic sebaceous glands. Very important point, remember these are seen as tiny yellow papules mostly in the lips. buccal mucosa, penile shaft and sometime also in the periareolar region. 
However, the most important sites are lip and buccal mucosa. Now, it is a very difficult choice to make when both of these are given in the question. If both of these are given in the question, then it is buccal mucosa more than lips for your answer. So, if lips, buccal mucosa are both in the option, then the most common site becomes buccal mucosa. You are sometimes also asked the treatment. There is no treatment required. Why? Because this is a completely normal thing. It is not a disease. So, no treatment is required for, for dicey spots. Just remember the difference from Fox for dicey disease. Clear? So, the answer to this question here is option B, which is buccal mucosa. But if this was a multiple choice question in your PGI exam, then lips would also be included here. Clear? Moving on to next question, true regarding keratoderma blenorejicum is, so where is keratoderma blenorejicum seen? This is what this question is asking you. Keratoderma blenorejicum is a cardinal feature of option B, Reiter's syndrome, which is now also called as reactive arthritis. So, reactive arthritis is the disease where you see this finding. What exactly is this? This is a disorder as the name suggests is reactive. This generally happens after an infection. Now, what is the infection? Infection can either be a genito-gastrointestinal infection or a genito-urinary infection. With the GI infection, it is mostly Shigella. Campylobacter or Yersinia with the genito-urinary. mostly chlamydia or other causes of non-gonococcal urethritis. Clear? What happens here? What happens here is a non-gonococcal urethritis plus conjunctivitis and arthritis. So, the patient may come with a mucoid discharge from the urethra plus minus dysuria. Here they may be painful redness of the eye associated with photophobia and this is mostly an asymmetrical arthritis involving the large joints, mostly the knee or the ankle, sometimes even sacroiliac joints. Okay. So, these are the main features of reactive arthritis. What apart from this? Apart from this, you may also have certain findings on the skin. The findings on the skin mostly resemble that of psoriasis. You may see crusted pustular plaques on the extremities. Then on the palms and soles, there is keratoderma blenorejicum, which start as vesicles, but then become hyperkeratotic plaques seen on palms and soles. What else is a 
circinate balanitis these are vesicles which again form scaly lesions seen on the glans penis and there are certain nail findings which are not important for the purpose of your mcq what are you mostly asked you are mostly asked a question on keratoderma blennerregicum or circinate balanitis because these for your level are seen nowhere except reactive arthritis so if a question is asking you the causes of one of these it is always and always reactive arthritis or reiter's syndrome this is a zero negative arthritis okay <coughs> how do you diagnose you may do stool cultures if the patient gives you history of diarrhea or dysentery then you may do urethral smears or culture or nat whatever treatment give antibiotics if the infection is still there otherwise nsaids methotrexate treated on similar lines as psoriatic arthritis so this is what you need to remember about reactive arthritis i have certain images to show to you so what do you see here you see this conjunctivitis these tiny brown hypokeratotic lesions on the sole keratoderma blennerregicum sometimes on the palate also you see certain erosions and afte on the tongue also you may see these findings and on the glands these will be called as <coughs> circinate balanitis clear to everyone so the answer here is reiter's syndrome now what do you see in disseminated gonococcal infection you see it in generally pregnant women or alcoholics you see pustules on the skin plus synovitis or arthritis plus fever so these are the findings in dgi in acne rosacea you see erythema flushing telangiectasias on the face while in psoriasis you see erythematous scaly plaques so even by elimination the answer is b reiter's syndrome moving to question number 32 what is the likely diagnosis of the disorder shown in the image so this is just an image based question there is no hint whatsoever in the text right solely and wholly it is the image which is giving you the answer now let us see what the image is telling us what do i see here one thing is that i see a patch of hair loss yes at least that much i can identify i know that there is a patchy hair loss here it is mostly a well defined uh, oval patch that is uh, quite uh, visible that I, there is a clear cut boundary here it's not irregular bizarre or ill defined it's a well defined oval patch the skin in the patch is quite smooth there is no scaling or vesicles or erythema that i see here so this is what i make out from the image now i look at my options alopecia areata androgenic alopecia telogen effluvium tenia capitis <laughs> sorry for the cough so what do these options look like i know for sure is that alopecia areata is definitely patchy and tenia capitis is also patchy but androgenic alopecia and telogen effluvium are causes of generalized 
hair loss. Okay. So, amongst the patchy causes of hair loss, I have option A and D. B and C are ruled out because these will cause hair loss all over the scalp, not such individual patches. So, now I am patchy hair loss. Mostly and always, I will have alopecia areata and tinea capitis as my options. So, how do I differentiate between these two? One will be alopecia areata and the second option will be tinea capitis. Now, how do I tell which is what? In alopecia areata, it will be mostly a very defined round to oval patch of non-scarring hair loss. Point to notice is that the skin in the patch will be bald, means complete loss of hair. It will be smooth. There will be no evidence of inflammation. like scaling, vesicles, pustules, erythema, nothing will be there in that patch. If I examine it closely, I may even see exclamation mark sign. I may even see exclamation mark sign. Okay? And that there may be a preservation of gray hair, they, one or two gray hair, I may see that they are preserved in the lesion. So, this is what alopecia areata will look like. However, a case of tinea capitis will be a well to in a defined patch. It may also be round to oval in shape. Excuse the handwriting here there will be a partial hair loss. So, I may see some broken hair left in the lesion. Skin will show vesicles or pustules and scaling. There will be a easy pluckability of the hair and there may be lymphadenopathy present or by occipital or cervical depending upon the level of inflammation in the lesion. So, this is Broadly, how you will differentiate between these two causes of patchy alopecia. Now, coming back to my image here. Look at the image. Out of the two that we discussed, how does it look like? It's a patch, clean, bald, smooth skin in the center. What is it? The answer is alopecia areata. Clear to everyone? Great. Androgenic alopecia and telogen effluvium, I have already told you, are generalized causes. In androgenic, you, if it is an image based question, you may even see a pattern in the hair loss. So, this may be a patterned hair loss that you see. Telogen effluvium is mostly not image based. There will be a history of a stressor around 3 to 4 months back. So, these two will be the hints towards these diagnoses. Tinea capitis we have already discussed. So, the answer to question number 32 is option A, which is alopecia areata. Clear to everyone? Here now, what are my questions from this text? I will just mark the question. You are asked exclamation mark sign and that the gray hair are preserved. In tinea capitis, you are asked easy pluckability and lymphadenopathy. Clear to everyone? Yes, of course, there are a lot of other questions. 
which may be associated with alopecia areata. I will just tell you certain more findings. You should know that this is an autoimmune disease, TH1 type. So it may be associated with other autoimmune diseases like vitiligo, psoriasis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. These are the other TH1 type of disorders. Here, what is the target? Target are your black hair. That is the melanocytes within these black hair, which is why your gray hair are preserved. Then apart from scalp, scalp is the most common site involved, but other hair bearing regions may also be involved like your eyebrows, beard, etc. Even rest of the body could be involved. Then the type of the lesion we've covered, exclamation mark, you've already seen. What else? Nail changes. In the nail changes, pitting is the most common nail change. The pitting here is regular pitting, so that is also called as geometric pitting and the nail looks like a sandpaper nail. Clear to everyone? So these are all the other questions that may be associated with alopecia areata. What else? Treatment. In the treatment, the most important point to remember is that this may resolve on its own. So there may be a spontaneous resolution. It is a self-limiting disease. However, the other options are intralesional steroid injection. Sometimes you are also asked the salt which is injected. So the salt that is injected is triamcinolone acetonide and obviously oral immunosuppressants can be given. So these are the questions that you are asked with alopecia areata. Subtypes are not questions but they may be sometimes options. In the other questions, alopecia areata patchy. Patchy is when you have few patches. Then you have alopecia areata totalis. Totalis is when the entire scalp hair is involved and you have alopecia areata universalis where you have all hair on the body are gone. So these are just some subtypes, not very common questions but they may be the options in some other questions for which you need to know what these are. Totalis is when the entire scalp is gone. Universalis is entire body hair gone. Clear? Great. Moving on to the next question, which is question number 33. Diagnose the skin appendage disorder shown in the image. Again, here there is no hint in the text. It is just solely an image based question, which is how you will answer it. Now, what do I see in the image here? Well, it's not a very clear image, but what I notice is that there are patches, multiple patches of alopecia. Scarring present or not, very difficult to tell in this question, the only options that I consider here are either alopecia areata or a cause of cicatricial alopecia because these are the ones which are patchy. Tugional fluvium as discussed in the previous question is a generalized cause of hair loss. Alopecia totalis is complete loss of hair on the scalp. 
So amongst my two options A or C, which of these is the answer? Now, to be very honest, if I look at the image here, it's very difficult for me to make a differentiation between areata and cicatricial alopecia because alopecia areata can also be patchy, cicatricial alopecia can also be patchy. The only difference is when I examine the patient clearly and I see whether there is scarring or no scarring. So that is the only way to differentiate between these two which I cannot do in this image here. So honestly, if I were in your place, this would be a difficult question because no, I can't identify in the image here. So trust me, you will not be given such a question in the exam. In the exam, images are very classical. No controversial images, no confusing images. They are mostly very clear cut answers. But in this question, if I were to go about it, I know that there is a type of cicatricial alopecia which is called as pseudopelado brock where there are patches of scarring alopecia which are completely clean. There is a, I'll just write it here. These are completely clean patches, no evidence of inflammation and these are multiple patches of complete scarring, means irreversible hair growth and this is called as a footprints in the snow pattern. If I do a histopath, in the histopath I will see a peri follicular concentric fibrosis. So this is what I know about pseudopelard of Brock. It is a very rare type of cicatricial alopecia. Mostly what you read in cicatricials are lichen planus pilaris and discoid lupus erythematosus. This is an entity which is missable. That is why we have it in the question here so that you know and you remember. Coming back to the question here, only because I know that there is something called as footprint in the snow. I can just make out here that this is like a dog walking in the snow leaving behind footprints. And that is the only way I reach my answer option C. But trust me, such an image will not be there in the exam. It will be a very clear cut image which will allow you to make a diagnosis. So don't get bogged down by this question. The answer to this is cicatricial alopecia. The only purpose of this question here is to reinforce this entity of pseudopelard of Brock. Moving on to question number 34, cyclopyrox olamin is used in. So this is a pharma based question talking about a treatment option. You have to know what cyclopyrox is. What is cyclopyrox? Cyclopyrox is a type of antifungal which is used topically. So where are these topical antifungals used? Topical antifungals will of course be used in option A that is dermatophytosis. A very easy question here if you know what cyclopyrox is of course. So the answer is A. Now some other topical antifungals that you need to remember. See azoles are there, clotrimazole, meconazole, ketoconazole, laliconazole. These are topical azoles. These are very easy because you know that if there is some azole, it's an antifungal. 
what is the difficult part here? Difficult part is to remember some agents which don't generally strike that easily. Amarolfin. This is a topical antifungal used for skin and nail fungal infections. Azoles are used for skin, hair, nail, all of these. Then you have cyclopyrox olamine. This is also used for skin, hair and nail. Then you have selenium sulfide. This is mostly in the form of a shampoo. This is used for skin and hair infections. So I am just listing some antifungals in these three which you can miss. So remember emerolfin is used in the form of a cream, cyclopyrox is a cream, shampoo, selenium sulfide is always a shampoo. Clear to everyone? So the answer is A year without any doubt. Dermatophytosis means fungal infections of the skin. Now moving on to question 35. What is the wavelength of UV rays used in Wood's lamp? 360, 460, 660, 760. You know it, you know it. Otherwise you don't know it. So what is Wood's lamp? This is Wood's lamp. This is how it looks like. Register the image also because there are a lot of questions which are these days asking you the tools which are used in dermatological examination or investigations. So Wood's lamp looks like this. Like the welders hold in front of their eyes when they are doing a welding. That is exactly how we also hold Wood's lamp. So this is how it looks like. Just imagine someone cutting iron bars, a welder. Now what is Wood's lamp? This is an instrument which is used for a bedside investigation in dermatology. The two important points about Wood's lamp is one that it has a UV source of light and that it has a special glass. So if this is the cross section of my instrument here, there are two lamps which generate UV light and this is this glass here which is the main area through which I see the patient. Now the important point about UV lamp is that this has to make a show means generate a light which is black in color. So even if it is illuminating, it is black in color light. Like this light here is white, I see it. But if you switch on the UV lamp, you will not make out that it is uh, generating any new illuminance. Why? Because the light wavelength that it makes is 360 nanometer. This is UVA light which is not falling in your visible spectrum. Visible, visible is 400 to 700. So this light is not visible to you. It's black light. This, the critical wavelength is 360 nanometer. Sometimes in other questions it may also be 365 nanometer. So you need to remember both these uh, values. Coming to the glass, like every other uh, glass, it is also made of silicate. So th it is made of barium silicate. But what is the khas bath? The thing that you need to remember is that this has a nickel oxide component in it. It is 9.9 percent nickel oxide. So this is what you have to remember. The question comes on nickel oxide and the critical wavelength. Both these points are important for Wood's lamp. And when we do Wood's lamp, we generally do it in a black dark room where there are no windows. We switch on the woods lamp, 
the light falls on the patient and through the glass we see this. So, if there are any positive findings that is how they look like. So, if here is the patient and here is the doctor. So, that is how we do the Woods lamp examination. What are the findings in every patient of a disease are also important questions with respect to Woods lamp, but we have a separate question coming up uh, subsequently. I will be covering that part there. So, the answer to this is A option 360. However, if it was 365, that could also be correct. Moving on to question number 36, pterygium of the nail is seen in. Now, pterygium of the nail and this disorder is extremely important question. The answer to this is lichen planus. Lichen planus can involve skin, hair, nail, mucosa, a lot of findings. I am in this question limiting myself to the nail involvement of LP. In the nail involvement of LP, what can you have? You can have nail thinning. ridging and ridging. Ridging means there are certain mountain like findings on the nail if I see it in the cross section. So, that is ridging. If I see it like this, it will appear like lines. What is now pterygium? This is the most characteristic oblique pathognomic nail finding in LP. Very, very important question on pterygium. What exactly it is? It looks like this. This is a wing shape extension of nail fold onto nail bed leading to ultimately destruction of nail matrix and nail bed leading to loss of nail which is also called as anno Nikia. So, this ultimately leads to anonychia and the important point is that it is permanent and irreversible. So, this is permanent irreversible, this is important for images also and important for text either way. Now, just one more point that I want to cover with pterygium is that in lichen planus you get dorsal pterygium which is also the most
these are the two hints from the question. What do I see in the image here? Notice these lesions here. These are multiple erythematous nodules seen on extensor aspect of the arm. That's it. This is the only thing that I gain from the questionnaire. I don't know whether it is painful, whether it is itchy, what is the duration, I don't know all that. The only thing that I make out in the image is that these lesions are nodules present on the extensor. Patient is a case of leprosy on treatment. What could it be? The only time I have nodules in a patient of leprosy is when the patient is suffering from type 2 leprosy reaction. That is the only time a patient of leprosy has nodules. So, if I see what a type 2 reaction is, the image that I have here is also showing me nodules. These are mostly present on the extensors. They are very painful. They may be associated with fever and arthralgia and certain other systemic involvement like uveitis, iridocyclitis and orchitis. Okay? So, this is type 2 leprosy reaction for me. Seen in patients of lepromatous leprosy being a type 3 HSM. Okay? So, in that image, I have to make a diagnosis of type 2 leprosy reaction or ENL. And they are asking me the drug of choice. The drug of choice for type 2 2 reaction is systemic steroids. If it was a multiple choice question and I also had this option of continuing MDT, then that would also be a part of my answer. Since the question mentioned patient of leprosy on multidrug treatment therapy, the option may say stop MDT or continue MDT. If it was a PGI question, multiple choice, I would also choose this continue MDT as my option because we never ever stop treatment while the patient is having a reaction. For a severe treatment, for a moderate to severe reaction, I would have systemic corticosteroids as my treatment of choice. The drug which is most commonly used is prednisolone. So even if prednisolone is in the options, that would be my answer. Certain other drugs like clofazamine and thalidomide are also used, but they are used only when my prednisolone is not that effective. So, they are not the drug of choice. With thalidomide, one question you are asked is why is it effective here? It is effective because of its anti TNF alpha action. With clofazamine, you are asked the side effect. The side effect is reddish brown pigmentation of skin. Clear to all? Yes, I also have certain slides on type 1 reaction. This is just for the sake of completion. What is type 1 reaction? This is generally seen in the borderline forms like borderline, borderline tuberculoid and borderline borderline. This is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. And what do I see? I see signs of inflammation that is redness and tenderness. redness, swelling and tenderness in the existing lesions most importantly. Then I see new lesions along with neuritis. So, these are my findings of type 1 leprosy reaction. If you see in the image here, very different from type 1 reaction. So, even if you are given in type 2, even if you are given in the image, there is no confusion between these two. 
see the redness and the swelling in the pre-existing leprosy lesion. There are no nodules here. There are no such things. So it is very different even in the image. Here also the treatment of choice is systemic corticosteroids. Okay? So coming back to question number 37, a case of leprosy on multi-drug therapy treatment thalidomide is my option but the best answer is prednisolone. Okay? The best answer is prednisolone. Moving on to question number 38. Identify the dermatological test shown in the image. What is it that is visible here? I see that patient's upper back is being used. I see some paper strips. on the back. What is it? Is it dermoscopy? No. Is it dioscopy? No. Skin biopsy? Again, no. The answer is patch test. So there is something which is stuck on the back of the patient. I have certain images here to show you what it looks like. Dioscopy, we've already covered. There was a question uh, previously. It was a glass slide which is pressed on the skin lesion. So that is dioscopy. Dermoscopy is this. It's a handheld instrument. Which is used to magnify the lesions. How does it work as? It works as a surface microscope. So it's kindly showing you features which are not visible to naked eye, which are not even visible to a routine magnifying lens. The routine magnification is 5x, 10x, maybe 15x for some very good microscope magnifying lens. But with dermoscopy, the magnification that I see is 70 times, 100 times or 200 times. So it is almost like a surface microscope that I have in my hand and I see those tiny features which will otherwise not be possible. So this is a dermoscope and that is how it looks like. We have a question which is talking about skin biopsy in the subsequent questions. I will show you the image there. Dioscopy you have already seen previously. Dermoscope you have seen. Does it look anything like this image here? No. The answer is patch test. Now, what is patch test? This is generally a test which is used in diagnosis of contact allergic dermatitis to identify the causes or to confirm the cause if a patient is giving me a trigger. Apart from that, what is the other use? The most important use for the purpose of your MCQs is to differentiate between a contact allergic dermatitis and contact irritant dermatitis. So this is the most important use for you. Questions are asked on this and on this. Clear? How does it look like? It looks like this you 
take the antigen pour it into the chambers on the strip mark it stick the strip on the upper back so the site is also a question and when do you read you remove it after 48 hours so this time at which you take the reading of the test is also very important 48 hours and what do i look like look for i look for any erythema papules and vesicles if these are present then my test is positive okay so this is all that you are asked about patch test FDA approved drug for the treatment of superficial basal cell carcinoma that's an interesting question because it is covering a topic which we normally don't discuss topical treatment of bcc mostly whenever we are discussing the treatment of bcc we come to excision most micrographic surgery radiotherapy but the topical drugs is an often missed part of treatment of bcc so before i move on to that i'll just discuss bcc in a little uh, brief not detail brief so bcc as you know already is the most common form of skin cancer so this is the most common skin cancer important question then this usually appears on sun damaged skin so the cause for bcc is ultraviolet b exposure another important point there is no pre malignant lesion or a precursor lesion like you see in squamous cell carcinoma or malignant melanoma bcc arises de novo and then the most common site is face so most common site is face and on the face most common site is the infra orbital region below your medial canthus followed by the nose so these are the most common sites on the face and as a rule bcc rarely metastasizes bcc rarely metastasizes however it is locally very invasive so this is also an important point that you need to remember but there have been a few questions which talk about metastasis so the risk of metastasis in bcc is less than 1% so the risk of mets in here is less than 1% and if that happens that happens through the lymphatic route okay so in case there is a metastasis here it will be a lymphatic metastasis normally that does not happen and this malignancy has uh, the histopath finding not normally asked but the catching point in the histopath will be palisading layer if they ask you the histopath and one of the options has cells in a palisading form then that will give you a hint of this being the histopath of a bcc a void cell nest in a palisading palisading means a line stacked kind of an arrangement so this is your palisading layer now how does bcc look like this is how it looks like you cannot get a more classical image than this this is the most classic bcc it will be a mostly a skin colored plaque with
rolled up margins. There will be telangiectasias on the surface and in the center of the lesion you may see a erosion which may bleed on touch. So this is how a BCC looks like as classical as it get, can get is this image. So such an image, look for the margins, see that the margins are rolled up. Rolled up means they are looking like this in cross section. So that is the rolled up margin. See it a little more closely. You see the telangiectasias on the surface, a small tiny erosion with a crust in the center. Again in this image also similar telangiectasia, pearly appearance and in the center you may notice a erosion if you slightly scratch it will start bleeding. So this is how BCC looks like and BCC is a chronic lesion. So the history if given in the question may be many years. That is also how you differentiate it from SCC or malignant melanoma because they are mostly short duration lesions. BCC due to the fact that it doesn't metastasize, doesn't lead to any systemic findings, it will just keep eating the skin in the local area, patient may or may not notice for a very long time. They may just think it's a small lesion, SA agya. So this is a chronic lesion. There is a variant which was asked in the AIMS uh, November 17 question that was the pigmented BCC. Their lesion will look black. So all same findings but it will look like a melanocytic lesion. Now coming on to the treatment of BCC. If we talk about FDA approved treatments, medical. So in the medical management of BCC, the FDA approved treatment as the question is asking us is either topical or oral. In the topical FDA approved treatments, we have five fluorouracil cream and this is MEQ mod. So this is generally 5% 5-fluorouracil cream and this is also 5% MEQ mod cream. So these are the two topical drugs approved by FDA for the treatment of BCC. In the oral drugs, you have the hedgehog pathway inhibitors, which actually inhibit the patched gene. These are your vismodegib and Sony Degib. These are approved for metastatic BCC, multiple BCCs, mostly in the basal cell carcinoma syndrome. So that is where they are involved. Okay. Vismodegib, Sonidegib, you are supposed to know because these are recent uh, questions, very probable, especially in pharmacology. And also from the dermatology perspective, in the topical it is 5-FU and Imicromod. Clear to all? Question, question. This also gives us the answer for our current question. And then you have these hedgehog pathway inhibitors, Vismodegib, Sonidegib. Of course, along with medical treatment, we also have surgical management. In the surgical management, we can do wide local excision or we can do Mohs micrographic surgery which is with frozen section. So we remove minimal amount of skin. We observe it then and there if the margins are involved. Margins are free. We close the lesion. If the margins are involved, we further take a 0.5 mm of the margin. So that is Mohs micrographic surgery.
So moving on to question 39, FDA approved drug for treatment of superficial BCC is imicumod. Clear? That is the answer here. Moving on to question number 40, a child is brought by parents with a complaint of a solitary well-defined whitish patch on the child's thigh. So after a very long time, we get a question where the text is giving us the answer. Otherwise, last many questions have been image based. So let us see what the text is telling us. It's telling us that the patient is a child who has a solitary well-defined whitish patch on the thigh. Which of these is a probable Diagnosis. If I look at the options here, all of these are causes of hypo or depigmentation. So all of these are causes of white patch. Now, what is my answer here? So for my answer here, I need to know all of these. What do these look like? So moving on to option A, piebaldism. What is this? This is a genetic disorder, autosomal dominant inheritance. There is a defect in a gene which is called as KIT proto-oncogene. So there is a defective migration of melanocytes. I see a white forelock of hair in the middle of the forehead which may be associated with islands of sparing. So these are the findings in Baldism. And since this is a genetic disease, there is no treatment possible. Now, what are the questions that are asked here? Inheritance, gene, white forelock along with islands of sparing. And that it has no treatment. So every point is a question. This is pi baldism rules out as an answer for our question because in our question the patient has lesion on the thigh. So the answer is definitely not thigh-baldism. Now what is albinism? Albinism is also a disease which is genetic having autosomal recessive inheritance there is a defect in the tyrosinase enzyme because of which there is no melanin produced in the melanocytes. So even though melanocytes are present in the skin of the patient, there is no melanin melanocytes present but no melanin. Now you have skin involvement which is completely depigmented, then you have hair involvement which is blonde and you have ocular involvement. Why? Because the iris is blue, there is photophobia, nystagmus and visual defects. So skin is white, hair is blonde and here you have irises blue, nystagmus, photophobia and visual defects because the retina also needs pigment. The rods don't function here. There is an increased tendency for skin tumors. Why? Because there is no melanin in the skin to protect you from the harmful ultraviolet radiation. So there is an increased tendency for skin 
cancers. And since it is again a genetic disease, there is no treatment possible. And this is a universal involvement. So the entire skin is involved. Melanin too is not produced in the entire body. So again, as per our question, a patchy depigmentation, albinism, not the answer. Now we are left two options, nevus achromicus and acral vitiligo. What is acral vitiligo? This is a subtype of vitiligo which is again an autoimmune disease, TH1 type associated with other autoimmune diseases out of which most common is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Then here you have no melanocytes in the lesion. Why? Because they are killed by T cells. So how will they produce melanin? There are no melanocytes in this lesion here. You have multiple depigmented macules with scalloped margins. Then leukotrichia may be present, which is whitening of hair within the lesion. You see Cobner's phenomena positive, right? What are the other questions in vitiligo? The other questions are, Pelle's me questions deeply. Let's see what is asked here. What do you mean? So these are the questions on this page. Then there is a subtype which is called as a segmental vitiligo. Segmental vitiligo is not autoimmune and it has a neurogenic pathogenesis. What is the treatment for Vitiligo, for generalized vitiligo, you give topically steroids, topical calcineurin bitters, orally also these things and next is <coughs> phototherapy in the form of PUVA or NB, UVB. For segmental vitiligo, you only do grafting. There is no role of immunosuppressants here. Clear to everyone, so that's about vitiligo. So if we read about vitiligo, again that is also not the answer because acral vitiligo would involve the lips, hands and feet. Again not the thigh. Next and the most probable answer that we have here is Nevus achromicus, which is also called as Nevus This is present. Since birth, size increases with age of the patient. This is due to defect in transfer of melanocytes. So there are no melanocytes in the lesion. Treatment is only grafting. 
there is no medical treatment clear so this is nevus depigmentosis this is present since birth it will be a completely white lesion size will increase with age of the patient and there is no treatment possible so coming back to the question the answer that we have is c which is nevus d pigmentosis or nevus achromicus now what would have been the most uh, closest differential had it been on the face pyeboldism would have been a differential had my option been localized vitiligo then again that is a probable differential, but there can also be multiple lesions, it will not be a single lesion mostly. So, the catch in the question is that it is a single solitary lesion on the thigh in a child. So, that is how you catch it here.